I know you expected me to come out with a Rams uniform. All these uh, sports analogies that I've been using uh, throughout this series, I know you were expecting that, but there's a reason why I'm a ref today, and uh, we'll, we'll talk about that briefly. Um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray. I'm going to pray, but I, the sermon today is... Um, I wrestle with it because I try to, uh, I'm aware of the context at all times. So Sunday morning generally is not a time to present something that requires a lot of um, deep thinking. Uh, I say that because people, people come, and I'm not trying to criticize anybody, but people come to kind of get their meal and go. And they're not expected to kind of think more deeply about things. And I'm a professor, so there's a professorial side of me uh, that I hold back on Sunday at least, right? And maybe present at a Bible study or something like that. Well, this is one of the Sundays I'm going to be the professor today. Okay, so this is going to have the overtones of a lecture. And not because I'm trying to lecture you. It's just because of how I have to present the material. And I was resisting it. And I've put whole sermons together in my notes and scrapped them because I knew it was too much on a Sunday. And, and it's Super Bowl Sunday, which is almost a national holiday in America, right? So people are looking to, to go uh, get to your Super Bowl parties. Well, I have to tell you, I'm, I'm probably going to go probably about 15 minutes longer than I normally go, potentially. And I'm only telling you that so that you won't get antsy and, you know, looking at your watch or whatever. Just so you know on the front end, that may happen because you can't microwave steak. You can't do that. It has to be it has to marinate, okay? So that means I got to talk slower. Uh, my statements have to be shorter, and I have to let you digest, and then I move on to the next statement, okay? So I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to get into this. Amen? Father God, I thank you for your goodness and your grace, and Holy Spirit, really more than ever, in it, and ever Lord God, I'm inviting you to speak through me to communicate what it is you want to communicate to your people, Lord. Leave me, leave my own thoughts about this out of this, and let me just communicate what you want to say. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, let me say, make some introductory remarks about our series, just so we're together. We, this is the part seven of a series called Supernatural, and I'm foregoing the story I no, normally tell today because I'm, I'm going to stay focused here, but just so you're connecting the dots with all the things we've been saying about the book of James. The series title is Supernatural, and our text has been the book of James. And, and here's, here's the main idea here, okay? Think about the term supernatural, right? When you think about that term, you're thinking about something spectacular, like something spectacular. We want God to do something spectacular, out of the ordinary, some kind of intervention in my life. But here's the, the, the idea behind the series, right? It's this. We're often waiting for God to do something super while God is waiting for us to do something natural. We're looking for the spectacular, some kind of bright inspiration, right? And James is like, just do stuff. Okay, that's Siri. He's saying amen to the sermon here. So, all right, so, 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 so the spectacular happens when we act in faithful obedience to God. So I'm going, to, I'm going to review some of the things that we've been talking about. Uh, but all the things we've been talking about, we're talking about how we use our mouths and how we behave and our compassion, those are all the things that while you're waiting for God to answer a prayer— while you're in a trial or test and you're tired and you're fatigued and you're waiting for wisdom, these are things you can do. You don't have to sit there twiddling your thumbs and wondering what's going to happen next. These are things you can be engaged in. This is what our uh, series has been about. And so we talked about there are three different areas of accountability. We talked about conversation, what we say. We talked about conduct and specifically our moral conduct. And then thirdly, our compassion. We talked about uh, our compassion uh, for the poor. So today, we're going to continue. I'm going to read another passage. We're going to read it together uh, from James, and we're going to bring together three different themes today. Uh, again, I was resisting this. I don't like to introduce complexity. 
uh, if I don't have the time in my mind to process it, but I'm, I was compelled to do this. So there are three things we're going to bring together today. Obviously, we're going to continue with the series in James. We're going to address some racial themes because it is Black History Month, and it would behoove us as we celebrate the Super Bowl, even though I'm not going to talk about this issue, to keep in mind that there is a lawsuit uh, being levied against the NFL because of racial discrimination. Again, I'm not going to talk a lot about that, um, but it would be... I could not mention that today as we address this issue. And then thirdly, I'm going to address this sports theme with refereeing. I know that sounds like disparate concepts, but if you stay with me, they're all going to connect. Amen? All right. So we're going to read James 3, 13 through 18. And if you wouldn't mind standing for the reading of the word of God, we're going to read verses 13 through 18. And then you'll be able to have a seat after that. And you can read with me here. Uh, We're going to start with verse 13. Ready? Read. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but it is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. You may be seated. Give God praise for the reading, hearing, and doing, and doing of the word of God. Amen? Hallelujah. So we're going to break the first statements down. The first statement we read, we actually talked about last week, but I'm going to reread it to connect it with verse 13 and 14. So I'm going to read verse 13 and 14 again. It says, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. I want to talk about that here. So as we said last week, wisdom is not measured by what you say. It's measured by what you do. Look at at a person's conduct to measure their wisdom. And then it says in verse 14, but if you have jealousy and selfish ambition, don't boast and be false to the truth. In other words, no matter what you're doing, no matter how noble your intentions or your actions, if it's rooted in jealousy and selfish ambition, You're not a wise person. No matter how wise the outcome seems or what you got out of it or whatever was profitable to you in your eyes, if it's rooted in jealousy, bitter jealousy and selfish ambition, the scripture says, don't lie. There's something in you that's not right. So don't claim you are wise when you are full of bitter jealousy and selfish ambition. And here's where I get a little bit into the lecture. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about the history of jealousy and selfishness. There's a history. There's a reason why those two attributes are isolated in James. It's deeper than the kind of touchy stuff we go through. People get touchy about, you know, why does so-and-so have a car and I don't have a car and all that kind of stuff, right? I mean, there's that, but it's deeper than that. And I want you to see it. So avoiding, and the other thing I will say that in my digital notes, I put a lot of the statements that I'm saying, so you don't have to, you can certainly take your own notes along with it, but you can, it's easier for you to follow along with some key things here. Okay, so avoiding bitter jealousy and selfish ambition is difficult because of a long-standing human condition. There's a reason why we have jealousy, and there's a reason why we selfishly pursue our own ends at the expense of other people. It's deep. Let me say this, and Brother Tamor actually spoke briefly about it. He was trying not to get into the details, but he spoke about this briefly, right? The constant conflict between the powerful and the powerless, constant, throughout human history. This is is just how the world is. Conflict between 
people who have a lot of power and people who don't. And this conflict surfaced once we left Eden, the Garden of Eden. We are familiar with the fall of humanity, right? But, but what happened is, in the, when we transition out of Eden, when we left God, when we said God, no, when we told God, no thanks, I don't need you, I don't want you, I don't trust you, we transition from a context of abundance to a context of scarcity. You really need to understand this, right? No one's jealous and no one is selfishly and pursuing things if they think there's enough for everybody. You just don't do that, right? You only do that if you think that something is being withheld from you. Okay, so, but here's the other thing. Abundance and scarcity are not just about material conditions, but also about mental conditions. Why? Because it's based on perception. It's based on what you think is available. You know, you invite people over your house, you're going to be generous, some people, based upon how much chicken wings you think you actually have. If you think you have enough to give away when everybody's done, you go, hey, have another chicken wing. Take some home. But if you think it's just a few for your family, you're going to be like, you know, you're going to start packing up the food before people finish their meal so they can't take stuff home. Why? It's the perception that there's really not enough for everybody. Okay. The scarcity mentality is based on three interrelated lies. Three interrelated lies that are identifiable in Genesis 3 when the serpent slash Satan is talking to Eve. And I'm not going to go there, but we all know the story, but I'm going to give you the main ideas. The first lie is this. God is not to be trusted. Very seductive, the way he came in and communicated. Did God really say? Well, he just said that because. Okay. So once you don't trust God, that's the root of idolatry. You're going to find another God to worship other than the true God. Because the true God can't be trusted. That's idolatry. Here's the second lie. God is withholding something from you. Here's this fruit. You could be wiser than you are. You can feel better than you are. You can enjoy more beauty in the world if only he would share with you. In fact, you should have that. That belongs to you. Why why is he God and you're not? Here is the third lie. You are responsible for supplying your needs. Oh, God's not going to give it to me? I'm just going to take it. Now, people, we need to be reminded that when they took the fruit, that was thievery. It's God's tree. You can't take his stuff without asking him. Well, he's not going to give it to me. I'll just, I'll just take it. I want it. It looks good. It's going to help me. Why can't I have it? I have the power to take it. He's not stopping me. It's thievery. But they don't think of it as thievery. They think of it as something they deserve. So it's selfish ambition. I will have this. Even if it's at the expense of someone else, it doesn't matter because I deserve it. I got to have it. The irony is that God supplies us richly with everything. See, people who believe these lies are willing to steal from things from God and from people. 
They don't think they're stealing. Again, they think they're merely securing what they deserve. And as I said before, they don't realize that God gives them everything richly to enjoy. 1 Timothy 6.17 says this, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God. Who what? Richly provides us with everything to enjoy. You don't have to be selfish. You don't have to be mean. You don't have to step on people. You can have everything you need by worshiping and depending on God. He is to be trusted. See, in the kingdom, abundance is the norm. You start with abundance and move forward. It's only a lie that tells you he's cheating you. He's, you he says, every other tree you can eat from. Why do you want the one you can't have? What, that is what jealousy is. It covers things that you're not supposed to have. That person's supposed to have that car. That person's supposed to get that promotion. It's not your time yet. No, but I want it now. Why are they having it? Why do they get to? Who said who gave them permission? I tried and it didn't happen for me. You better trust God. He got something for you. See, here's the flip side though, right? Outside the kingdom, poverty is the norm. It's the norm. Let me explain it to you. Genesis 3, 17 through 19 are really, the scripture is going to explain it to you. Notice, it says this. And, Adam, and to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree which I commanded you, you, you shall not eat of it, curses the ground. Because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. Till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and the dust you, you shall return. What is this saying? Now you got to toil to get stuff from the earth. It's just not going to give it to you. In the garden, you still had, he still had to tend it. The Bible says that Adam had responsibilities, but he didn't have to toil for abundance. Didn't have to compete with anybody. It was richly provided to him. Because of the fall, the earth no longer generously offers its goods to us. Unless you actively wrestle with the earth and its conditions, you will be poor. The earth doesn't give you anything. You got to work for it. And as the scripture says, you don't work, you don't eat. So because of that, conditions on the earth after the fall are also inherently competitive. Because everybody's scrambling to get the resources that are scarce because the earth doesn't just give it to you. You got to what? Work for it. And you got to be the first to get the good stuff. Eat or be eaten. Everyone on the planet is trying to avoid poverty and secure prosperity. So it's a competition. And guess what? The attitude that Satan planted in the minds of Adam and Eve is the attitude everyone else has. If I have to make somebody else suffer so I move ahead, so be it because somebody's going to step on me. So I better be the first. I better be the first. That's the whole principle behind this, you know, we talk about nuclear war and why some countries keep their nuclear arsenal because you give up your nuclear arsenal, then I'll give up my nuclear arsenal. I mean, I don't want to have a nuclear war, but I got to be ready. Just I got to do a preemptive strike because I don't know what you're thinking, but I'm going to get you before you get me. There's, there's too many of your allies in the region. I'm just going to, let me just take a proactive stand on this. There's some things going on right now in our world that are tied to that. Eat or be eaten. So what happens is people take things from other people. They steal from other people. 
with updated versions of the lies from the fall. They take the attitude that, they, that, that Satan had toward God and they extend it to people. Hear those same lies again, but in different ways. Lie number one, God is made in my image. I'm not made in God, he's made in my image. So they, they, Romans tells us they have idols and things made to look like animals and humans. If you read about the Greek gods, the Greek gods, when you read about them, they just seem like humans with superpowers. They don't act very divine. They just act like spoiled brats who have power. And it's just human beings with power. Number two, I'm taking this from you because I deserve it. Bitter jealousy. You you ever see, did you watch the movie Black Panther? Remember, Remember the guy with the claw? Remember what he was saying? He said, why do the Africans have vibranium? They shouldn't have it. I should have it. I should have it. They shouldn't have vibranium. I should have it. It's mine. Who are they? Why do they have those resources? We should have it. We know what to do with it. Jealousy. Number three, I'm taking this from you because I can. I got the power. If I have the power, God gave it to me. There's powerful people and there's people who don't have power. The powerful people got to rule the people who don't have power. That's just the way the world works. Some people have to be masters. Some people have to be slaves. Sorry. These attitudes aren't specific to race or specific to nationality. This is a human condition. This takes place in every part of the world throughout history. It's not special to the U.S. of A. It isn't. Okay, so so here's the thing. These conflicts happen not only on an individual level, but also on a collective level. So, So nations, countries are motivated by versions of the same three lies. What are they? God thinks like us. God would do what we would do. Right? This is, they, they come up with their own ethical standards and rationality. This is the most ethical thing to do, to have responsible people be stewards of the earth. And we happen to be gifted leaders who know how to rule people. We should be the ones who lead the world. I know they, they're not going to like it. They won't understand it. So remember the uh, Avengers and Thanos? Remember Thanos? He was like, I've got to destroy half of the world. They don't understand that. But the world would just be better if I'm in charge, somebody has to make the tough decisions, I'll make them. Somebody has to rule the world and deal with the pressure of it, I'll do it. Somebody has to, you know, have to be the person to deliver the bad news, I'll do it. No one else can. So you have that basic spirituality and idolatry. Second lie, same lie. We must steal to avoid scarcity. Economics. That's why countries conquer other countries. They want resources. So they don't have poverty. Somebody's going to be poor. It's just not going to be us. Somebody's not going to have resources. It's just not going to be our country. Because in a a world with competition, if you stand pat, you're going to lose. You're going to lose. Third lie. We must steal to create the security that comes from abundance. Because once you have enough resources, you're not worried anymore. That's the idea. Like, I've accumulated enough stuff, I got peace and joy right there in my bank account. Peace and joy. You know, listen, money will respond to most things you would pray for. It will. So you're like, if I have money, if my money's long enough, you know, I'm good. Then my country's good. And, again, somebody's going to suffer. It's just not going to be me. That's just the way of the world. That's just how it is. So, so, so when nations plunder other nations, they don't think they're stealing. They just think they're working in harmony with the way the world works. Eat or be eaten. Eat or be eaten. They're like, look, don't you enjoy going to, you know, Target and going to baseball games and folk? Don't you love that? Well, the leaders of the world say, well, that has a cost. You got to let us do our dirty work behind the scenes. All, all the, pros- the, the leaders of the world say, all the prosperity you're enjoying comes at a cost. 
We got to do some things you may not be proud about, but don't you want to go to Starbucks? Still want to go to Starbucks? You still want to just enjoy your game today? Then let us do our job. That's how leaders think. We benefit you by doing the dirty work, and because that is the way the world is. It gets better. I'm, I, I, got, I I'm, got, got some harsh words today, but we're gonna, we're gonna, it's going to be uh, encouraging by the end. We just got to let me get through this, okay? <laughs> so here's how we get more specific. So what do nations take from each other? Three things. Land, people, and natural resources. It's simple. It's simple economics, folks. It's not personal. Racism is not actually personal, though we experience it as something that's personal. I mean, how, how are you going to see somebody lynch and not take that personally? That's personal. But that's how we experience it. But that's not actually, it's not actually personal. It's opportunistic. So this is how we get slavery. It's economically, politically, and ultimately spiritually driven. Those are the reasons. It's not the little things we talk about on the news. It's not. So two things to note about slavery itself, two things. Okay, one, I know this is, this is strange, but it's the truth. Slavery is not particular. It's not like, you know, the world is like singling people out to be slaves. It's where there is opportunity. That's what people do. There's nothing special about you that makes you inferior or superior. None of it is. It's just, again, opportunistic. Slave mastery is not particular to Europe, America, or white people. It's not. Enslavement is not particular to Africans. It is not. It is taking place on every continent and every people group. And there are probably many people in this room who are descendants both of slaves and slave masters. The other thing, slavery is not personal. Again, I know it. You, I, we all experience personally. I, I'm not denying that. I'm just saying that the driving force behind it is not personal. People of African descent have been uh, the victims of a particular kind of oppression, yes. People of European descent have been the beneficiaries of a particular kind of oppression, yes. And none of that is personal. It's simply a modern and racialized version of an old game. You can test this because if you do your homework on any time in American history where white people have oppressed black people, somewhere in that, there's a black person benefiting from that. You have black people who oppress black people, and they're benefiting from it. That's, not, that's economic and political. That's not that's nothing to do with race. That's opportunistic, right? And if you look at white people who've been disgruntled about their experience and they've been told some black person, Hispanic person, Native American person, or Asian person is out to get them, you do your homework, it was none of them. It was some white person pulling the strings, giving you havoc. But they told you it was some person of color ruining your life. Why? Because green rules the world, baby. You know the conspiracy theory about Martin Luther King's assassination is that it happened precisely when he tried to bring together black folks and poor and working class white folks. When he started to talk about economics. Now, I don't know the true story, but that's what he, that, was his, that was his new train. He started talking about the war. He started talking about poverty. He started talking about the working class. He started talking about the bigger picture.
race exists, but I'm telling you, it's just the one layer. In this game, there are winners, losers, and casualties. And in some eras, Africans have been the winners. You won't necessarily know that in America. This is why I said at the beginning, black history starts in Africa. Because it's not always been like this. In some eras, people of European descent have been the losers and the casualties. Kingdoms rise, kingdom fall. Kingdoms rise, kingdom fall. Why? It's, it's a competition. And they're all going to rise and fall because none of them are the kingdom of God. That's why the Bible says in Acts 17, he has determined when you're going to be born, what country you're going to be born in. Why? So you can seek God. Whether you are a slave master or a slave, wherever you get inserted in time, find the Lord. Seek the Lord. Because in that kingdom, there is abundance. Don't make sense to your circumstances, but that's a kingdom of abundance. We behave differently. Get out of this mindset of scarcity. So you take things from people, and you're jealous, and you're ambitious, and all these things where you're hurting people, and you don't care because you're in your mind is scarce. Somebody's got to win. Somebody's got to lose. That's not the kingdom mentality. Satan is not racist. He's an opportunist. That's why Ephesians says, don't give him any place. Because then he has what? An opportunity. Okay. So that last point, I'm going to connect to my next point. I need you to hear this clearly. I need you to hear it clearly but carefully. I'm going to explain it, okay? This is partly the reason that there should be limits on how personally you take racial aggression. I didn't say don't ever take it personally. I didn't say don't take it personally at all. I said there should be limits on it, on how personally you take racial aggression. This applies to everybody. So for people of color, when there are racial insults or whatever, there is a space to have emotion. There is a space to respond appropriately to that. And you have limits on how personally invested you get involved emotionally. If you are white and you're offended that someone called you a racist and they don't know you and understand you, there's room to have emotion. There's room to take appropriate action or whatever it is, but you have to have limits. If you are a Christian, you have to have limits on how personally and emotionally invested you are in the conflict. This does not mean, again, that you should not express emotion around racial offenses. This does not mean that you should not take actions to respond to racial offenses. I don't know all the details of the Brian Flores issue, but he's suing the NFL. I have my own opinions about it. It's probably appropriate. From what I can tell, I don't know. But it sounds like that may be the appropriate course of action given the circumstances that have taken place. But we'll see. We'll see what the judge says. What this does mean is that you should not adopt the spirit of the offender to respond to the offense. That's the no-no. You can have emotion and you can take the appropriate, well, that means having a conversation. Could mean a lawsuit, could mean talking to whoever, addressing the person you disrespect, whatever it is. Those things are fine, but what's off limits is adopting the spirit of the offender. Why? And James tells us, verse 15, James 3, 16, actually. James 3, 16, he says, why? For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. Doesn't matter what you're trying to do. Doesn't matter what you, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what they got away. Doesn't matter. If you get involved, you a ref. That's your first priority. Listen, I'm, I'm rooting for the Rams. I have rooting interest. But today I'm wearing the ref uniform because when you're reffing, 
You can have a rooting interest in the outcome, but you got to be the ref. It, it can't undermine your ability to referee. You're an essential worker in the kingdom of God. The world needs peace, and he's put you in places so the world becomes more peaceful than it was before you got there. That's your primary assignment. Whatever else you're trying to get done, you can have rooting interest, yes, but it cannot undermine your role as a referee for the kingdom. No matter how noble your intentions, once you become a feeder of strife, you become a tool of the devil. Doesn't matter. It's sort of like trying to play things with a credit card. I'm telling you, no matter how well you manage your money, you're going to spend more money paying for it with a credit card than you are paying it with cash. They know how to, they, they, the credit card companies are smarter than you. All they need to do, all they need to get is your numbers. You're going to spend more money. Why? They just needed an opportunity. Because they know how you're going to act. You're going to forget about the, 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 you know, the repeated payments. You're going you're gonna to spend five times as much. All they needed what? Is your numbers the opportunity. That's what the devil is waiting for. He don't care what you're trying to do. He just needs to get you jealous and ambitious. I got you now. I got you. Satan traffics evil through strife feeders. He's smuggling evil through you. Just like he's smuggling evil through the person who offended you. Don't participate. Just like when you go to the, the, the airport and somebody gives you a suspicious ta- uh, package. Don't take it. They ask you, did somebody give you something? Don't take that. Give me drugs in there. I, I'm not, leave me out of this. And that's what you should be like when there's strife. You say, leave me out of this. You can have the money. I'm not participating in smuggling evil. When we embrace the spirit of the offender, we feel that we are right. When we view the circumstances through our offense, we will be convinced that justice is on our side. When we view our experience through offense, we attribute intelligence to our motives and actions. Our offenses will attribute wisdom to the way we respond. That's the way you're supposed to respond who cuts you off. That's what you do. Scriptures insist that we reject this wisdom no matter how compelling it is. Why? Because in James 3.15 it says this. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above. It is earthly unspiritual and demonic. And I'm not going to expound on this right now. I put it in your notes, but those three things, economic, unspiritual, and demonic, they correspond with the three ways that Eve was tempted in Genesis 3 and 6. They correspond with the ways that we're not supposed to love the world in 1 John 2, 15 through 16. And they also correspond with the temptations of Jesus. Those three lies. I don't, I'm, I'm not going to break that down right now, but they're there for your reference. Those three lies are circulating, tempting us to engage in tr- the trafficking of evil. So how are we supposed to act? Verse 17, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial. Impartial impartial, even though you want them to succeed. I'm black, you black, brother. You know I'm rooting for you, but, bro, you're not right. You're not right. I love you. I will pray for you, but I can't be a part of that, man. I can't. I'm a ref, man. What am I going to look like not calling that foul? What am I going to look like not doing that? P. 
people who take on this attitude hold the following things in mind. Racial, racial strife, again, is not fundamental, fundamentally personal or particular, even though that's how we experience it. Number two, we must limit how personally we take offense and privilege our role as referee. And number three, you can have personal rooting interest as long as you don't undermine your role as a referee. So, yes, I'm a pastor, and I, yeah, I, I root for black folks. I do. I'm an African-American. I'm a part of black associations. I pull black people together on my jobs. I'm a part of a black association that helps my kids because the school system doesn't service their needs in the way that I want them to all the time. So I'm a part of a black organization that helps them to learn. Sometimes you got to do what you got to do. There's nothing racist about that. And many of you do the same thing. If you're Asian American and you saw, what was the, the, the name of the movie? Shang, help me out now. Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. There are some Asian Americans whose chest was sticking out because of that. That's okay. That's all right. You can be proud about that. You can be proud when you see one of your own is succeeding in a world where everybody is saying you can't succeed. It's all right. All I'm saying is you you cannot not call fouls as the ref. That's all I'm saying. You work for the kingdom. I'm going to close with this, with some practicality, because, you know, one of the things you learn as a pastor is that there's no shortage of people who have opinions about what you should be doing. what the church should be doing. Amen, Bishop. Amen. <laughs> There's no shortage of opinions. And with a subject like this, with an African-American pastor and a church where there are many African-American people that are like, so what you going to do, brother? What, what, what's up? You know, I see pastors out there, man. Protest, they out. They, they there, man. They making it happen. We had the privilege at Biola to have uh, Cornel West, Dr. Cornel West come and uh, uh, participate in a debate. It was fantastic. And, and if you listen to him, he'll talk about where he teaches, like, you know, look, if I'm teaching and there's a protest outside, I'm going to stop the class and go to the protest. He don't have to have all the information. He's he out there with the sign. He'll go to jail, all that kind of stuff. That's not Pastor Joshua. That's not Pastor Joshua. But it's not because I'm against it necessarily. Listen, over the course of my life, I've been enlisted in the causes on the left and the right. People wanted me to lend my voice to stuff. And I just say, I don't, I mean, I'm not against it. I'm even sympathetic for it. But I don't feel that I need to say something publicly about it. That's all. God didn't ask me to say anything. That's not my lane. I know what my lane is and I'm comfortable with it. There are many ways to contribute. And I mentioned it briefly, but I added a few more. I'm going to just go down on a list of eight things you can do. To, if you're wondering, what is the church going to do? It depends on what you want to do. Because the whole church don't have to do the same things. We talked about it before. Number one is advocacy, activism, protest, service, prayer, fundraising, motivation, and development. They're all needed. And this is a church that excels on the latter half of that list more than the first half. That's our gifting and calling. Advocacy has to do with policies and laws and procedures and processes where that, that, that addressing things that marginalize people in public policy. Activism about, is about using your platform to become vocal about injustice. Protest is about gathering crowds and organizing people and facilitating sit-ins and other forms of preferably peaceful demonstrations. Why do they do this? To show numbers, express sentiments, and make statements that communicate a collective objection to injustice. Some people, that's their role. They got it. They got it on lock. Other people, it's service. They don't care about the infrastructure. That's too much. I can just, I can feed somebody. I can tutor somebody. I can drive somebody. I'm going to fulfill their basic needs. you got other people who are people who pray. Now, people look down on that because all y'all do is pray. You better be happy somebody praying. You're making appeals for divine intervention into the natural and spiritual causes of injustice. Some people fundraise. You think, BL, you think Black Lives Matter is not taking people's money because they work for Wall Street? You think, well, did you march? Did you come to meetings? They're going to take the money. They, they'll take money from Republicans. They will. Somebody got to pay for this. 
That might be your role. You might be a fundraiser. How about motivation? People need to see folks who look like them doing well. They got to see it. There was a young lady in the program I teach, and she came to my office. She says, I'm here because of you. I'm the only black person in my cohort, but I'm here because of you. My brother kept taking me to orientation, say, be in this program, and I didn't know, but then I saw you. Then I was in the program. I have, an, I have another two students. One, I helped get into a doctoral program. She's working on her PhD. Another young man, he's working on his PhD. And they said, I'm the first black teacher they had ever in their life. In their life. You got to see people doing well who look like you. And for some people, that's your area to keep succeeding. Because somebody's looking at you. They may, you may not know them, but they know you. We need permission to imagine and to innovate. Then, of course, development. You got to tear down things that don't work, but you got to build things that do. Somebody got to build it. Somebody got to have a business. Somebody got to be an entrepreneur. Somebody got to dream. The, somebody got to build the Wakanda. Quit telling me it can't happen when I saw Star Trek and the stuff from Star Trek is now reality. That Star Trek was imagination. Until somebody, so many of, there are so many real technological advances that were inspired from Star Trek. Why can't we build Wakanda? Who says you can't? Folks, everybody has their role. Be comfortable with it. Don't be self-righteous about what you're doing. Don't hate on people doing something else. Everybody don't have to think alike. Give black people some humanity. We can have diversity of thought. Some people can be Republicans. Some people can be Democrats. Some people can be moderates. It's all right. Just be the Democrat Jesus would be. Be the Republican Jesus would be. Be the moderate Jesus would be. Amen? Let's pray. Let's pray. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father God, we just thank you for this Sunday, a day that people have held in high admiration for sports, and we're not diminishing sports. We've been using sports analogies in our sermons today, Lord God, and we want to just give glory and honor to you. There are people sitting there, perhaps on site, perhaps online, and you recognize that you need to get your life together for Jesus, that you need to turn to Jesus, you need to serve him, you need to worship him. Uh, he, it's been clear to you over the course of this message that God is serious, that he is somebody who can be trusted, that the, the lies you've been told, that God can't trust him, God took something from me, and I got to do things for myself, those are lies from Satan. Those are lies from the enemy. The truth is that God can be trusted. He is for you. He is for you. And he wants to bless you and your children. And if you recognize that it's time to turn from the way you've been living life and turn to the way God wants you to live, I'm inviting you to say a prayer with me. I want you to repeat after me. But here's the funny thing about that. If you just repeat after me, the words mean nothing. However, if you repeat after me and you recognize in your heart there is a sincere desire to draw near to God, that you're sincerely ready to turn away from your old ways and turn to the new ways, if that is the case, then those words will have power transformative power. So if that's you, I want you to repeat after me. Dear God, I come to you now. I recognize that I am a sinner and that I am in need of salvation that comes from you. I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins, shed his blood, was buried and resurrected, and that when he was resurrected, he gave me the power to live a righteous life. Fill me with the Holy Spirit so that I can continue to live a righteous life. I submit to Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. If you said that prayer for the first time or maybe for the first time and meant it, I want you to type Zoe Save to the number on your screen. It's our, that gives us the ability to follow up with you and to uh, connect you with other people who have your story and who are on this walk with Jesus just like you. 
The other thing I want to say is that for some of you, as you came, as you said that prayer, it's possible that you experienced something miraculous. That there was a super, that there was a language, a strange language that came out of your mouth. The Bible talks about that as the gift of speaking in tongues. And sometimes that happens when people come to faith. I'm encouraging you to embrace that. There may be some of you out there who desire to receive more from the Holy Spirit and his gifts. The scripture says that we should earnestly desire the gifts of the Spirit. And if that's the case, you should earnestly desire that. And we're going to have a small course uh, later this month that will expound more on the reality of the Holy Spirit and his gifts. Finally, there may be people here today and you are discerning, uh, trying to determine whether this is the faith community you want to be a part of. And if that is the case, I want you to type Zoe member to the number on your screen. We will follow up with you and you will receive some information and also an opportunity to dialogue with me to determine if this is the place for you. And we look forward to having that conversation with you. With that said, it's been fantastic to be before you all.